My name is Jocelyn Fry. I am your Libertarian Party of Iowa District 3 rep. And I decided to come out and make a visit to Pottawami County, because I'd never been out here before. And we originally didn't have a, a plan. Mark and I just going to come out and figure out what to do. Well, then it turned out that I needed to be in Omaha. So Iowa is a co-chair um, for an event called the Unconvention, which is going to take place on Memorial Day weekend uh, next year. Um, it's a three-day event with uh, speakers and educational opportunities. And my part in it is to be the chair of the Family Track Committee. So we're going to have a whole um, separate uh, run of family events and you know, speakers and entertainers. So we decided I would come and talk. Of, um, I, we would make it worthwhile to um, make it a double <coughs> Our caucuses are coming up in February, and we thought we would do a caucus prep. We've never done that as a party. We've never had a caucus in, in primary. Um, but those preparations are not actually in place yet. So I can't teach you how to do caucusing yet. The state party is still working on that. So what can we do to make this event interesting now that I can't actually do caucus prep? So we thought we'd have some of our candidates come and speak. And, and maybe hold a debate. So that's what we're doing today, and I want to thank you all for being here. Um, the first speaker we'd like to have come up is Jules Offenbach. She is running for Secretary of State. So, give her a chance. Thanks. You got the Jocelyn. Hi, I'm Jules Offenbach. I am a libertarian candidate for Iowa Secretary of State. I grew up in Russia, and that's where I learned to dislike large government. With large government, large government means it's a powerful government. And a powerful government means you don't have rights. And coming to this country, I learned that there are two options. There's a Republican option, and there's a Democratic option. And those two options, I never could decide which one is better because I didn't like choosing between two evils. When you choose between two evils, you ultimately choose an evil. I've always been very fiscally conservative and I've always been socially liberal. I always thought that other people's business is not my business. Um, and I hated choosing between the two parties. Until 2012, um, Mr. Gary Johnson came on to John Stewart's program, The Daily Show, and spoke about the Libertarian Party. And that's when I discovered that I no longer need to choose, and that was a fantastic feeling. I am running for Secretary of State because I have computer background. My undergrad is computer science. I spent 10 years in networking and security, and then I became a lawyer. And I specialize in business and business litigation. And there's one thing that I can tell you that the state of Iowa is lagging as a Secretary of State's office, and it is computerized election, uh, election process and computerized business registration. I register about 20 businesses a year at minimum. I physically cannot be there registering those businesses as a Secretary of State, and I cannot spend those days sitting in that office and asking them to register them and waiting for them. So I do it electronically. I file my businesses that I represent electronically. It takes about three to six weeks on a good on, on a good day to register business electronically. Why? It's all database. Why is it taking so long? I have the knowledge and I have the skills to implement the right program because that's what I'm used to do. Being a lawyer also puts me in an interesting position where I may not know all the laws, but I most certainly can look them up, and I most certainly can figure them out. I don't need a training to figure out the election laws. I can just read them. We recently had a candidate challenged by the Republican Party for a special convention, um, and I'll tell you the truth, until then I never looked at the election laws before. I read chapter 32, I believe. Um, and went and fought the challenge and won. That's what I do. I am a trial lawyer. I read the laws, I apply them to the situation, and I win most of the time. 
and that's why I'm the Secretary of State. Thank you. So next up, we have our congressional candidate, Brian Jack. Give me a second to zoom the cameras out because I'm a little bit taller than you ladies. So. <laughs> I'll keep this brief. Uh, my name is Brian Jack Holder. I uh, lifelong resident here at Council Bluffs, Iowa, and I've uh, run for Congress in 2014. And last year, I joined the Libertarian Party to uh, advocate for liberty and justice for all of us. I'm um, running again next year. Uh, we've got a primary now that we're a major party in Iowa. And uh, I want to test uh, the theory out that we're all equal before the law because uh, I've been excluded from uh, debates on Iowa public television in 2014 and 2016. And uh, my fellow libertarians have been excluded from these debates also in the past. So we're going to see that uh, hopefully we'll get in the debates. But we've got Jules here as an attorney. And if we have to file a lawsuit to uh, get in the debates, we will do that. So, you have a question? Can we sue the entities that denied us access to the debates in the past for damages on those previous occasions? Well, the difficulty with that is that uh, if the file, if the suit was not brought back then uh, to try and prove damages, you have to have standing before the court. And what the opponents of our position would say is that the election is already over. So. If you want to have standing, you're going to have to sue for the debates that are going to happen in the future. But if they exclude us from the debate, sure, we could ask for monetary damages. Uh, myself, I wouldn't ask for any monetary damages. I just want to have an equal amount of time uh, on the debate stage and an equal opportunity to be heard. So, uh, If anyone wants to know about me or my campaign, uh, my website is holder for iowa that's H-O-L. D-E-R-F-O-R-Iowa.com. Uh, I'm on Facebook and I have a YouTube channel where I film public meetings, I film high school sporting events, uh, concerts, and uh, also I film our elected officials every chance I get to hold them accountable because uh, I found that they won't hold themselves accountable and we can't depend upon the mainstream media to do it. So us libertarians, us in the liberty movement, it's time for us to bring out our cameras and uh, I suggest that, unlike the Republicans who talk about Second Amendment remedies, I'm willing to exercise my First Amendment remedies. So, thank you. So, now we're ready for the exciting part, the part we've been waiting for, which is the debate between our gubernatorial candidates, Jay Porter and Marco Attire. But before we do that, I want to point out that we have petition uh, forms in the back. All of our candidates would greatly appreciate your signatures on those forms. So I am going to invite our moderator, David Demers, uh, uh, to take over. Thank you. Welcome, everyone, to the inaugural uh, Iowa gubernatorial debate featuring two stalwart uh, Iowans. And by the way, uh, Jake and Marco, can you join me up here? As you know, the Libertarian Party of Iowa achieved major party status as a result of Gary Johnson getting roughly 4% of the uh, presidential vote last November. Uh, major party status was formalized earlier this year by uh, the uh, person that uh, Jules is running against, the Iowa Secretary of State. And uh, so uh, the Libertarian Party of Iowa will be participating in primaries for the first time in 2018. Today's uh, inaugural uh, Libertarian gubernatorial debate is indeed a historic event to be celebrated by Iowa Libertarians. Uh, Marco and Jake uh, have agreed to the following uh, innovative debate format. So uh, both, uh, they will choose among themselves who will lead off and we flip a coin 
and so Marco will get the first opportunity to speak. After that, we'll alternate on uh, subsequent questions. Both candidates have agreed to keep their answers concise, so we don't have to use a time. Members of the audience are invited to submit written, signed questions to be reviewed by the moderator. And uh, both, uh, after both candidates introduce themselves, several questions will be posed to each candidate that have been submitted via Facebook. Thank you, Jocelyn, for getting those uh, questions. Uh, each candidate has prepared three questions to be asked to the other candidate, and this is the innovative part that we're uh, taking a shot at. And uh, the, uh, the moderator will uh, pose the first two of these three questions to each candidate, and then the third question will be posed by uh, the candidates directly to each other. Uh, the moder uh, moderator will review written, signed questions submitted from the audience, select and uh, pose the first two questions directly to the candidates. Uh, the, uh, a member of the audience may be invited to uh, pose the third question directly to the candidates. So uh, be sure and submit your written uh, questions and be sure and sign them so I know who to call on for at least one of the questions. And you all have a blank sheet of paper. I expect a flood of questions to come up here. And make them challenging. To conclude the debate, the moderator will ask each candidate to summarize their gubernatorial candidacy. The goal of this friendly debate is not to trip up the candidates, but rather to provide uh, both participants a forum to address issues that are important to both the audience and the candidates. That often isn't taken into account in uh, other debate formats. We want to make sure that the candidates get to address questions that are important to them. Okay, let's get started. Uh, Marco, uh, why don't you introduce yourself and uh, tell uh, the audience why you're running for governor of Iowa. Sure. Uh, Marco Vitalia, and I uh, was born and raised and educated in Des Moines and uh, Cedar Falls, Iowa, and uh, was a media major, so I think early on I saw political issues from the whole spectrum and kind of had my own decisions about what was what was someone just uh, telling the story without embellishing it or slanting it to a certain side. And uh, what really got me interested was seeing how the party was advancing and seeing how uh, the different people that we had maybe were considering to have run and it just played out. Uh, growing up, I saw these politicians that would go and talk to one group of violence, and they would say one thing, and then they'd move on to another group and say another. And I got, I got really tired of it and really removed from it for a long time until I found the Libertarian Party. And uh, I see this disturbing trend of people that are running for governor nationwide that have a lot of their own business interests uh, in mind, uh, I feel, and they're wealthier and wealthier candidates. And then they get out of state money from wealthier and wealthier people with their own agendas. And I want to work against that. I want to give Iowans uh, a voice on the ballot that is not uh, contributing to that trend. And uh, I think uh, I had a good idea for a platform that was strong. And that's why I decided to throw my name into consideration. Jake, same uh, question. <clears throat> and by the way, if uh, you two want to use the podium, uh, I'll be happy to. Thank you. First of all, I want to thank uh, 
want to thank Dave for, uh, for moderating this. It was a very generous of him with his time to do this. I am honored to have him here. An LNC Libertarian National Committee representative. Uh, he has a job that no one wants, that's for sure. I certainly don't want it. Uh, so I'm glad that he did that. I want to thank everyone for coming out here. I want to thank uh, Jules Offenbach for running for uh, Secretary of State and uh, Brian Mulder for uh, running for Congress. Uh, so I'm going to start a little bit about myself. Uh, so my name is Jake Porter, and I am running for governor. Uh, my history in the party has went back uh, several years. My history in the Libertarian Party of Iowa has went back to 2006. So I'm a long-time Libertarian. I've seen strategies that work, strategies that don't work. And I've also ran for office a couple times before, so I have a name recognition across the state of Iowa. I've got a base of support that I can use. And that will help us maintain our major party status. The major party status we've got is important. We have to maintain that in this next election. It's going to be all for, it is going to be a waste. That's what I plan to do. So I originally announced that I was going to run for governor back in 2016. And then I we got major party status with Gary Johnson. So I uh, left for a while, took over as interim executive director of the Libertarian Party of Iowa. And then we did not have a candidate. This was back around July. I decided to step back in. We have had a tremendous amount of support uh, that has shown up. We've been on the TV, radio, uh, newspapers across the state. Just a couple days ago, I had another op-ed that was, that was published. We've done uh, two candidate forums with the other candidates for governor. We're going to do a third here uh, in a couple of weeks. And I think that's definitely what we need to do. Now, why I'm running for the issues, I'm concerned about the state budget that we have. We are in a budget crisis. Rape kits in Iowa are not being tested because we are in a budget crisis. The state is not allocating money to that. The state is allocating money to waste, to pet projects. The state taxes you more, the government grows, and you're told you can do less. We have uh, people that have served their time and paid for their crime in this state that will never get their voting rights restored. You know, fewer than, it's a couple hundred out of 25,000 people have had those voting rights restored in the past few years. That's wrong. It's also wrong that sick children cannot get their medication. And there's a lot of things that uh, we're going to go through that budget line by line that I plan to do that will resolve these issues. And, you know, we're going to be, a, I plan to be a governor for all lives. We have the, uh, you know, a lot of juvenile attacks being slung back and forth by other candidates. But that's not going to help. We have to reach across the party lines to everyone, uh, people that are apathetic, people that don't vote, and explain to them what the state is doing and then come work together to find solutions. So that is why I'm running a little bit about me. Thank you, Jake. And this is your first step for the first of the uh, Facebook uh, questions. So what is the most important change that you would make to stimulate the economy and encourage job growth? I think the first thing we got to do is to take a look at the fact that I just meant to go to the budget. The budget is in crisis. We give corporate welfare to Iowa's biggest companies. We have the Research Activities Tax Credit. This actually, there are companies in Iowa, large corporations that don't pay taxes, but the government gets them a welfare check. These companies write, literally write the regulations that put small business out of business. You know, in the last census, 77 of 99 counties lost population. They lost population because of overtaxation, property taxes, overregulation, small business moving out of this, you know, out of the state because they can't afford to do business in the state. And we raised the taxes on the poorest islands, right? They're talking about raising the state sales tax now uh, to fund, you know, I don't exactly know what it is to probably to balance their budget that they can't balance. They borrow from emergency funds. This is all very important, and what it does eventually is it passes the tax bill onto the smallest counties. What they're doing is the state government is no longer offering these services. The government is still doing them, they're just doing it at the county and local level. So your taxes are not going to go down if somebody's still doing this. They're just passing the tax burden down to the smallest counties. Your property tax is going to go up, these smaller counties are going to continue to die. So the first thing we need to do is we need to look at the budget, go through there, balance the budget, quit borrowing from the emergency fund. And then we go through, we cut any uh, you know, program that's not necessary, any pet projects, and we lower taxes and we cut regulations on businesses that are unnecessary. Thank you, Jake. Uh, 
Uh, Marco, same question. What is the most important change you would like to make to stimulate the economy and encourage growth? I think that the current way that uh, the Iowa government is attempting to meddle with the economy is actually pretty much across the board harm, harmful to growth, harmful to stimulate innovative new businesses. They're, they're keeping markets in place. They're upholding markets that people are really starting to move beyond. Um, I think we need to look to the cities, uh, more rural cities and bigger cities in Iowa that are actually growing their population and they're doing this by encourage, encouraging innovative new businesses. They're basically uh, uh, working to, I think, working towards the sound monet monetary policy uh, across the board is really going to help everyone that's trying to start up a business in Iowa. Uh, basically reducing taxation across the board and I think uh, right now we spend a lot of money training Iowans to do jobs and they get high they get highly skilled but then they they move to other states because they're they're not well thought out government policies we're training them you know to go some case move to other countries and uh, and I think if we can actually focus, the money we're already spending on training new uh, people, new skills, new jobs uh, for jobs that Iowa's going to need in the next 50 years. Uh, things like in innovative new agricultural jobs, uh, more actual skills as opposed to creating more bureaucrats. I think that basically a lot of the, the core of what we need is in place. It's just changing how we how we spend those money, how we spend that money, maybe we can work smarter and spend less money and work to keep Iowans trained for jobs that we're going to actually need them to do in the next 50 to 100 years. Thank you, Marco. Uh, Marco, as governor, what would be your number one priority? I think uh, I think what we really need is uh, I'm really going to focus on working to get Iowa towards zero income tax, and I think uh, by doing that you have a comprehensive tax reform plan, and you can really address the things that are really pressing to Iowans across the board in the way that you present the budget the way that you present a future tax plan. You can tie all of it to the things that we're talking about every day, mental health funding tied to soil and water conservation. And I think you can really appeal these uh, to both sides here by being you know, a third kind of disinterested party from the agenda of the other parties and worrying more about what the citizens want. I think by working that all into a tax plan that appeals to Iowans across the board, not pandering to left or right or wealthier or less, uh, you know, less wealthy people. Uh, I think you start with that and you really touch on the issues that we're talking about every day in Iowa right now and how that's going to explain to people how that's going to tie to uh, how you getting us to no income tax is going to tie to these issues like mental health funding and uh, soil and water conservation. Thank you, Marco. Uh, Jake, as governor, what would be your number one priority? I agree with Marco on that. The budget is my number one priority. Uh, if we don't get our fiscal house in order, we're going to end up in the same shape as Illinois, California, maybe a couple decades away, but ultimately that's where we're headed. We're headed to disastrous things are happening now. Roads and bridges are crumbling across the state. We look at uh, our education standards have fallen. 
we look at uh, anything else, with it, whether it be uh, rape kits not being tested, uh, highway patrolmen not uh, being able to respond to accidents, because that's the funding that's been cut. Pet projects have not been cut. We look at the budget, it grows. Pet projects seem to never get cut. The services that would be more essential are the first things that get cut. Domestic violence shelters, mental health facilities, the things that ultimately add more to the budget in another area. Now, Marco mentions uh, you know, eliminating the, the income tax. Uh, we can eliminate the income tax or sales tax, but you don't want to do that in uh, a reckless way like, uh, like Kansas has tried with some of their policies. You don't decide that you're going to just eliminate one and increase the other to pay for it. I think uh, Kansas had uh, tried to eliminate the uh, state income tax by increasing the sales tax. That's dangerous. It's a, ta it's a tax on the, uh, the poorest islands at that point if you were to try it, especially if you're not cutting government, because you end up taxing the poorest people that are, that are going to not be able to make it. You're going to spend more in, in welfare whenever you do that, or you're going to drive people out of the state where they, they can't make it, they can't find work here, they're going to leave. We see uh, a flock of people coming in from Illinois now because of their federal policies. We've got the same federal policies that are ultimately leading us in the same place. We're borrowing from our emergency fund hundreds of millions of dollars a year. That emergency fund only lasts as long as there's an emergency fund left. So if we don't, and, and they'll, they'll try to blame it, they'll say it's a, it's a bad farm year. Well, the problem is not a bad farm year, it's you spent more money than you took in. They can't even pay their tax refunds on time because they don't have the money in the treasury, then they lie to you about it. That is immoral, it is unethical, and it needs to be put an end to that our government should be honest about where the money's going. We should look through that budget line by line. Anything that does not belong should be eliminated. Anything that is a pet project should be eliminated, and things should be made more efficient. Your tax dollars should be spent very efficiently. We should not be giving welfare to large corporations while putting you with the tax bill. Thank you, Jake. Uh, Jake, how would you change the Office of Governor, such as compensation, benefits, self-term limiting, uh, changes that would benefit the people of Iowa? You know, if I wanted to uh, break Governor Brandstad's record, I would uh, have to serve for quite a few years. So I think I'll term limit myself before that. Uh, I think uh, three terms is probably good, you know, four years, Three terms, that, that's probably enough for anyone to get anything they, they need done. One thing I would look at doing is potentially um, phasing out and eliminating the lieutenant governor position. That would be a cost saving. The whole lieutenant governor position is being used for right now is to go around and do photo ops across the state of Iowa. I don't think we probably really need that. And it just propels somebody else to become a career politician and run for office. That's something I would look at doing. Um, there are ways that you could. It used to, I think, be written in the Constitution. Many, many states that don't have, like, the Secretary of State, Laufenbach, she could, uh, she could, if something happened to me, she could take over after that. That's that's one thing. Uh, we could also look, does the governor really need a chef at Terrace Hill? Does the governor really need to live at Terrace Hill? And that's, that's something we'd also look at. So the Office of the Governor, that's, it's, it's a pretty small thing as far as uh, the grand scope of what the budget is. There are definitely things we could do uh, to revise that. But I think that's kind of where you start. You look at all the benefits, like the chef of Terrace Hill, we really need that. You look at uh, things in there uh, that you could cut within the administrative services, combining stuff that the governor and lieutenant governor does now, and then potentially eliminating some of that. Thank you, Jake. Uh, you're up first on the next one. Do I answer that same question? Oh, yes. As uh, governor, uh, let me go. uh, how would you change the office of governor, such as compensation, benefits, and self-term limiting, to benefit all people of Iowa? In regards to term limits, I can tell you that I will lead by example. I'm not a career politician, and uh, I don't plan on making this making a living off of this. I don't plan on being in government in. 10, 20 years, I think I can do a lot in, the, you know, four years is a lot of time. I think uh, that first budget is uh, a big uh, way to get things started off right. And uh, I, I would not be opposed to, to making less money, investing money into the state, 
I think we should have the same benefits as the citizens of Iowa. I really don't think there's any good reason for people that are going to be deciding medical issues, health care for Iowans to not have to experience what everyone else has to experience, not have to participate in the same markets as everyone else. Uh, I'm really fair game to a lot of changes in terms of our comforts as, uh, you know, we're supposed to be public servants. And uh, I know two things I would add. I would add a candidate, uh, I would add a governor at that desk that cares about the Iowa Constitution and the whole Bill of Rights, and I don't think we've had that in 50, 100 years. Maybe. Marco, why is the Libertarian a better choice for governor of Iowa? At this time, being the, the newly recognized major party, breaking the two-party system, uh, you get a lot of questions from people that are used to the same old, same old use from, you know, from Democrats and Republicans especially. Most of the other people are really excited. Uh, everywhere I've gone around Iowa, there's a lot of excited people that we now have a third major party. But I think the benefit of having a libertarian-minded governor in Iowa is going to be that uh, we really don't have, we're not tied to these long-term pet projects from the Republicans or the Democrats. We're not beholden to their donors. Uh, we, uh, we have no preference. We're looking at good legislation that can get to our desk. We're not, we're not saying, oh, we really want Democrats to succeed, or we really want Republicans to succeed, or we want this guy to replace us. I mean, we're actually getting to start with a, a clean slate in terms of, we can show people that uh, if we don't go down these roads that the other parties have gone down in terms of cronyism, uh, and uh, just accepting more and more, for lack of a better word, bribes from big name you know, companies and people in Iowa, uh, that we can really do something different. And I think we can help give independents a voice, and that's the biggest political affiliation in Iowa right now. I think that we're going to be welcome to other parties that want to work just as hard as we did to get ballot access, to get a chance to debate, and we're going to be completely open to them because we just experienced uh, you know, a huge fight to just get to where we're at. And uh, yeah, I really think we're, we're able to work with anybody that's elected. It doesn't matter where they're coming from. Thank you, Marco. Jake, why is the Libertarian a better choice for Governor of Iowa? Not only is Libertarian a better choice for Governor of Iowa, it is the only choice for Governor of Iowa. Unless you like what you're seeing now, do you really like this? Uh, do you like the fact that rape kids aren't getting tested? Do you like the fact that the state overspends its money, can't pay your tax refunds on time, fights like little children? Do you like that? This is turning into a horror film. You know, Boris Karloff could play uh, Ken Reynolds, you know. This is not what we want. It is not working out. The Democrats and Republicans, they both throw government. They both take away your civil liberties. They both disenfranchise people. They both give money to big corporations. They both take bribes. We need a party that wants to get the government out of your bedroom, out of your billfold, out of your gun cabinet, and that's the kind of governor that we need. That's the kind of libertarian party that minds its own business. The kind of party that believes that you know best what to do with your own body. That as long as you're not hurting anyone else, that you have the right to do what you choose. You have the right to spend your money as you see fit. You have the right to live your life as you see fit, so long as you're not harming anyone else. And that doesn't matter what some busybody or bureaucrat in Des Moines thinks. So that is why the Libertarians are the only rational and sane choice you have in Iowa. And America, too. Thank you, Jake. Now we get into questions that uh, contrast the two uh, uh, candidates. And the first one comes from uh, Facebook. So, Jake, how would you compare yourself to Marco? 
I like Marco. Marco's been a uh, long-time friend of mine. Marco even said on Simon Conway that he would take a bullet for me. I would also take a bullet for him. Trust me on that. Uh, by having this primary, we're having a debate. We do disagree on some issues. That's good. We are now going to have a primary that's going to bring people into the party. I think that uh, you know it's, it's not so much it, it, there's a, a style difference between us. You can decide which one you like best. Uh, there's a marketing difference. I think that I've got the experience. I think I've got the, the name recognition. I think that you know, I've ran for uh, Secretary of State twice, uh, both times receiving over uh, 33,000 votes. I think I can do that again. That would definitely keep us the, the major party status. But you know, as far you know, if he gets the nomination, I will definitely support him. I guarantee that. Thank you, Jake. Marco, how would you contrast yourself with Jake? He did mention a, an appearance on Simon Conway. And uh, Simon Conway said he would not take a bullet for you. Yes, I did not like that. I told him he would not take a bullet for security detail. You can be honest. But, uh, yeah, I've, uh, well, I, I have experience. I've been a, a bouncer and door guy and security, so we can cut that for my budget too. I don't think I need any of those things. And, and if they kidnap me and we don't have a lieutenant governor, the you know, secretary of state can just take over and forget about me. And uh, but really, uh, one thing that stood out to me going around the state is Jake has presented a plan to start by uh, water down, taking away the sale uh, the sales tax. And I really think that. The income tax is the way to start. I think we have examples of states that are doing really well that have zero income tax. I think, uh, you know, and they have fine, top notch, world renowned education. They have quality roads. They have uh, great public services and, and they pay zero income tax. So I think that's where you start. And I think that's how you can get Republicans and Democrats to come together. To start with the income tax, as opposed to starting, you know, obviously we both want to reduce taxation, reduce the tax burden on islands across the board. We just have a different approach on how we're going to get there. Uh, I think another big difference is we have different types of name recognition, different types of background. I've been in blue collar and white collar work. I've worked with the press. I think. Uh, I think I can relate to what most islands are doing for work. I've done it and you know been successful, raised a family doing it. And uh, yeah, I think uh, I, I can really relate. I've been in banking, insurance, factory work, and uh, just keep uh, you know keep moving up. And I've uh, seen seen uh, people that are doing great citizens doing great things in all those jobs. And I think I can relate you know to the average island. Thank you, Marco. Uh, now we get into the questions that are uh, actually prepared by the candidates to ask to each other. Uh, I will ask the first two, and then the third one you get to ask directly. So, uh, Marco, uh, actually, this is to Jake. So, from Marco, how would you persuade those and other parties and independents that a libertarian governor? would be beneficial to Iowans over the next four years? And Marco, you can answer your own question after that. Yeah, absolutely. So we we want to work, you know, across party lines, work with all, all Iowans, ultimately. We may not always agree on the issues. We may not always agree on the, well, we probably hopefully agree on the issues. We may not always agree with the solutions to those issues. But we can do that. You, you do that by being a kind person, by being a decent person, not by just being antagonistic or uh, you know confrontational with everyone that disagrees with you. You go, you go to the forums, even when someone disagrees with you, you go to those events that you have, and you have a message that really resonates with everyone. Uh, this is a message that you know that, I, that I'm bringing to the um, the people of Iowa that does resonate with most everyone. I think whether it be a uh, uh, Medical cannabis for sick children, whether it be medical choice for people that are sick and dying, that's something that resonates with everyone. No one likes to pay more money in taxes, I, especially when it's going to something that uh, 
to big government, big corporations. Uh, big corporations may like it, but uh, the average island doesn't like it. That's something that a message that almost everyone agrees with. People want to be free. We just have to give them that option. We've got to show them that we are a credible choice uh, and that the Democrats and Republicans, they know how bad they've messed up. Everyone knows how bad they've messed up. We can look around to see how bad they've messed up. We just have to show them that we have plans and solutions and we're going to work with everyone and we can get this done. So I, I would definitely go across there and continue to speak across, the, across the Iowa to every group of people that are willing to listen to me uh, speak. One thing you're not going to see from, from a libertarian governor, at least no one that's run yet in our state, is do I foresee this problem. Uh, things like uh, Governor Reynolds recently getting in trouble for, you know, getting uh, people getting critical about her having donors that have worked against the 9 11 families or being able to <clears throat> sue certain parties in Saudi Arabia that took. Uh, you know, part of the events of 9-11. And I think, why is an Iowa governor even connected to this sort of thing? It's ridiculous to me uh, that, that we have this kind of system where an Iowa governor even gets a chance to be involved in something like that. Uh, you're not going to have that from our party. Uh, you're not going to have these conflicting uh, people that we're going to appoint to a, you know, things like uh, a various board, board that's going to decide whether eminent domain proposed is fair and uh, whether compensation to landowners is just. We're not going to say, take money from the people that are proposing a project and then appoint this crony group of people to a board that have one opinion on eminent domain uh, that lean much more towards the government side of things than the property owner. And uh, we just don't have these sorts of conflicts of interest. We might agree with Democrats and Republicans on, on some issues, but we don't have people, you know, throwing money at us trying to get us to, uh, to stack the deck in their favor. Here's a question from Jake to Marco. How would you plan to keep major party status. What I have been doing recently is traveling around to every part of the state I can and encouraging candidates to run you know, for open positions from uh, the Libertarian Party. And I think the more candidates we can get running all over the state, I think the ideas are there. The ideas are good, and it's the, you know it's the right time and place for a libertarian government. And if we can get a, you know a choice in every county, uh, every time people go and vote, there's a libertarian there that they know. It's better when it's someone that they work with that's their neighbor. And um, just giving them that choice is uh, going to make a lot of people take that choice. I think I think that. We show a steady growth, and we're not going to compromise that by taking funds from, from big crony capitalists. We're going to keep doing what we're doing, keep educating people, keep getting people to run that uh, are your neighbors and, and uh, everyday islands as opposed to some guy that, you know, one of our kids or someone that we're friends with that we went to school with that we think would... Uh, make the Iowa that we want to see. We want them to be independent-minded and, you know, talk about the issues from their county. And I think we easily keep major party status and we keep growing. And pretty soon, you're going to have three parties and then maybe a fourth party that have a lot uh, more equal numbers than what we see right now. Keeping major party status is critical. It has brought us so much more exposure, so much more attention we cannot afford to let it go. It's going to take, I estimate, about 25,000 votes to keep major party status in the next election. Two times I've run for Secretary of State, I've received over 33,000 votes. Uh, one was in the, uh, the most recent one, had four people in the race. That's about what I expect this time. We have a few more. I don't see keeping major party status, I don't, I don't think that's going to be an issue at all. 
uh, in my campaign because we've already we've got the list of people that we need to target. We're doing the Facebook advertisements, we will do the Google advertisements, the YouTube advertisements, TV radio if we need to. We will go door to door. It's all about really organization. How can we organize? How can we put the volunteers in place that we need across the state of Iowa to bring these people out to vote? So I'm, I'm aiming for much more than the, the 25,000 votes. I definitely think that we will receive that. Uh, I, I'm going to do my best to win this election, but uh, sure that we will keep major party status. Uh, so I've done, uh, I'm going to continue to do the, uh, a lot of media interviews that I've done. I've done appearances on my KGAN uh, TV out of Cedar Rapids. Uh, been mentioned a few times in the Morning Register, uh, mentioned several times in the Cedar Rapids Gazette, uh, Watt City Times, you know, Cedar Falls out of Waterloo, so probably more media coverage than any uh, other candidate for governor has ever had. I've already got in this race this early on, we're still a, a year away, from, almost a year, about 11 months away from the election date. So we're going to keep doing that. We're going to organize people. We've got a bigger volunteer list than what any other candidate has had at the end of their election. We're just going to use those people, make sure they're in the right place. And as Marco says, we're also recruiting candidates. That's an important thing to get other people running. This isn't about one person. This is about a team of people that present an idea, present a set of values to the people of Iowa, and eventually um, start to implement some, some change in our political system we have. Here's a question from Marco to Jake. If you were to become the next governor, what, how do you foresee your use of the line item veto? We would have to increase our budget for pins. That's, that's what I definitely think. You know, uh, one of the things the governor does is they go through and they set a recommended budget. That recommended budget um, is, if you, not, not even going into the sub details of each department, just out of out of everything in there is 1,043 pages, I think it is. You can go through that list, and then you go through the sub-details. This, this is a time-consuming thing, right? And then you find out things that are in there that you are quite for sure what does, whether it be like an egg council board that charges a five-cent uh, tax every time you buy eggs, uh, carton of eggs. There's things like that hidden in there. You read it, you're not like, what, what does this do? What does this promotion board do? What does what does this thing in education do? And you find out oh, it has nothing to do with education. Uh, you go through, you submit your budget. The legislature fights with you. They send it back, and you can you can veto. You can also negotiate with the legislature. So yeah, you're, you're going to have to give up certain things. You're not going to get everything you want. That's part of our political process. Anyone that tells you they're going to run up like a dictator is lying. You know, a lot of people thought Terry Brownstead was a dictator, but even his power was pretty limited when it came to the legislature. Uh, you cannot uh, run the thing like a dictatorship, but you can negotiate and you can point out and use the bully pulpit uh, whenever the state is doing something wrong. And you can go through and, and use the, the vetoes as much as possible. There's a uh, lot of powers of governance that libertarians are not too fond of. Uh, lots of things a president or a governor can do right now that uh, we don't want them to be able to do. And your best line of defense against that is by putting a libertarian in as governor. We're not going to abuse the power that we have because we don't, we simply don't believe in it. it would, uh, look, we wouldn't elect the next libertarian governor if we went against the core principles of our party. And the line item veto, there's examples of governors that have used this. One is, uh, a governor, who's governor uh, for multiple terms, and his state's not falling apart. They rather liked him, I think, and uh, he helped us get major party status. That was Gary Johnson. He used the line item veto very efficiently, I, I believe. And uh, really, if you see this bill, Democrats, Republicans are fighting back and forth, and they keep adding, adding all these things to a bill that might be about mental health, but they get all this extra language in there, try to sneak something in there because they know Iowans want this issue addressed. You can use the line item veto to basically say this is what the citizens wanted and this is what you guys put into this legislation. And uh, you can rectify that situation and, and really be a defender of uh, a lean and uh, 
uh, ethical government as opposed to one that's going to say they're helping the citizenry on one issue while they're patting their pockets on three or four other issues at the same time. Here's a question uh, from Jake to Marco. What are your future plans personally within the Libertarian Party? <coughs> I started off just getting signatures for candidates, started off helping other people run. I didn't have this big goal of one day running for office, one day running for governor. I, I plan to go, really go back to doing that after, after this race. Uh, I can't imagine in my lifetime any other party coming to our status that I fit more in line with, and actually I like to think it was the other way around. I, I fit this party's platform as an individual before I even knew that it existed. So you'll just see me going back to helping candidates that I believe in and helping people get signatures. Uh, I could see myself going back into the press and uh, kind of going along uh, this path of actually presenting news stories that are happening in Iowa as opposed to trying to get revenue by making people fight over some left versus right issue. So basically I can see myself going back into a more liberty-minded press. I definitely will go back to helping candidates that I believe in. Well, I've been here since I was 16 years old. I'm going to stay a libertarian until the day I die. So I'm here to stay, whether it be you know, running for office again, I don't know. Hopefully I'm running for re-election next time after this, so that would already be decided for me. I suppose that doesn't happen though. Uh, I will definitely remain active within the party. I will continue to recruit candidates. I will continue to help out uh, county parties. I'll continue to give speeches. I'll continue to write op-eds. Uh, so I'm not going anywhere, that's that's for sure. Uh, I didn't dream of, whenever I first got involved at the age of, age of 16, of, of running for governor. That uh, Even a couple of years ago, I didn't dream of running for governor. It just so happened that, that opportunities presented themselves, and I was in this position that I thought that I could be a benefit to the Libertarian Party, and also getting our Libertarian ideas out there to a wide audience that I decided to run. So that's, that's not going to change. Um, maybe I will run for office again. But uh, there's so many different ways. I would, I would hope that we've recruited enough candidates that the way you find better candidates than me to, to run for these offices, that you know, in the future that we keep uh, bringing more people in and that we actually change the direction of the state. And I'll continue to fight against bad laws whenever they arise, as they so often do. Thank you, Jake. Now, this last question will be posed directly from candidate to candidate. And uh, so, Marco, why don't you? This first one and the rest of the sure. Jake Porter. Historically, Iowa candidates that were not the leading Democrat or Republican were largely ignored in the polls and by the press. How do you plan to get your platform heard by the most Iowans over the next election cycle? They want to continue to do what we've done. I think we've had a lot of success with it, and that is to there's a lot of new things that we've got out there and we're testing out. We can advertise and target people specifically that are very likely to vote for us. That will help us in the polls get, in, get included in these debates. I'm also going to reach out to my opponents, and you know, I've debated them twice now. I'm about to debate a third time, and Marco will hear uh, soon. Uh, our major party opponents have been informed for them. We're going to use that to show people that we should be there. And if they don't let us in, we're going to raise hell about it, right? You bet. We will, yes. They, they will let us in because the amount of publicity we get if they don't let us in will definitely keep that major party status. So they're going to be afraid not to let us in, then they do let us in, and we're going to feed them in the debates. So there, there's just no, no way they can win this. We're going to keep doing it though by getting media coverage wherever we can. We're going to uh, use uh, new technology, whether it be Facebook, Spotify ads, YouTube ads, whatever, Tinder ads, I don't know, whatever the young people are using, we're going to do it. And we are, we're going to do even traditional, direct mail, door knocking, phone banking, whatever we can, we're going to hit them with, on multiple fronts, we're going to make sure we get in the debates, we're going to make sure that the polls include us. Sure, I'll address my own question there, I guess that makes it easier. 
Only if you talk in third person. <laughs> the uh, I really don't think uh, the other parties running TV commercials. Uh, they've, they've lost. The other parties have lost their way from the the classical liberal to the conservative Republican that you know initially wanted to abolish slavery instead of put more people into slavery. I think them trying to touch on these out of touch issues like what bathroom someone's going to use, uh, they're probably going to run commercials about that. Commercials that they pay a lot of money for, they throw a lot of money down the toilet. You know, you know people are watching their favorite shows on apps that don't have very many commercials, least of all commercials from local politicians, state politicians. People turn those off. I, I grew up seeing political commercials way too often, and I turn them off when I see them. So we're gonna we're gonna get the attention from actually going and talking to people in, in small cities, in large cities. You know, a city where there's a couple hundred people, we'll go and talk to them, and that's gonna be better than paying money that uh, that we're gonna have to try to earn back by compromising our positions, or you know, that's what the other parties would do. And um, I think uh, using social media, we can reach more people than an old-fashioned political ad is going to reach. I'm not saying we won't do any of those, but if we do, they're going to talk about the issues. They're not going to, you know, we're not going to start this invented feud or, or something like that. So, and um, I really think that's that's how you do it. You actually go and, and let people ask you questions and. Uh, let them tell you, it's a novel idea, let them tell you what's going on in their city, in their, their town, their county. And, uh, you know, that's going to be more effective. These people are, we already have it every time I go to a new spot, then you get them telling their neighbors, them telling 10 other people. By the time we get to the primary, they're going to tell hundreds, thousands of people about uh, the option. And that's going to be much more effective than running a TV ad and spending a bunch of money for an ad that no one sees. Good question, uh, Marco. Uh, the next question is from Jake to Marco. Marco, if you win the uh, Libertarian primary, if you beat me, uh, how do you plan to get media coverage and ensure uh, participation in general election debates? I think for going on a century, People in this party have faced uphill fights, they face ridicule, they face uh, slander and libel from the other parties, and they got away with it because we didn't have uh, the same kind of money behind us back then. And uh, I think it's inevitable. I think, uh, you know, we're snowballing to the point where they're not going to be able to ignore us. They invite uh, just uh, the Beginning of December, December 5th in Des Moines, we're going to be in a forum with everyone recognized by the Secretary of State that's running for governor. And uh, uh, they're not going to be able to ignore us any longer. We've had more and more credible candidates running locally, running at the state level, running at the federal level. And uh, I think all you do is keep, uh, keep presenting good ideas, and it's inevitable at this point. How many votes does it want to take to win the governor race? No. You know, that, that just depends. We're, we're talking about, you know, a three-way race, you're talking around 350,000, somewhere in there, depending on how, you know, you so split it up different probably ways. get about 15 times as much recognition, you know, name recognition as like this as we've got so far. What, uh, what's going to be interesting right here, right now, is you have, uh, they weren't sure people would step up and challenge rounds, and there's still three people that are doing so, two or three challengers. Um, that was kind of a curveball for the Republican Party. They'd rather just pass the torch uh, nice and simple to uh, the protege, the brain stag. And uh, then the Democratic Party, you have a lot of uh, infighting just in that party between the establishment and the more progressive elements. And there's seven, seven or eight people still in that race. 
So uh, I would say we have already better name recognition than half the people that are running for governor right now. Awesome. And uh, you have uh, you know a wealthy insurance CEO that is likely front runner for the Democratic Party. He's got you know streets and buildings named after him. So so he should have the, the name recognition advantage right now. But I don't think that's going to appeal to Democrats or Republicans. Some guy that his company took advantage of glass steagall or being repealed, and a Democrat actually did that, so that's, you know, ironic. Uh, well, what being repealed? That uh, was glass steagall legislation, because he was CEO of uh, an insurance company that combined their, if you go up the ladder, they combined uh, investment banking, banking with insurance sales, and that was something companies couldn't do prior to uh, that being repealed. And uh, it's to me, it's a conflict of interest running on his party's platform uh, and, and being, you know, becoming a millionaire off, off that sort of thing. Uh, but yeah, you know, I really think uh, there's going to be a lot of uh, infighting, a lot of people split in those parties, and that's going to play to our advantage this time around. And in the future, it could be that, that could go back to being the case um, where where there's two guys or two, two people, two women that are standing out above the pack, but we really don't have that right now. Jake, why don't you go ahead and answer your own question. Okay. So, we've uh, got media coverage. We continue to get media coverage. As long as we have an interesting story and run an interesting campaign and reach a lot of people, the media will continue to cover us. The people are tired of the Democrats and Republicans. They want a new story. The Democrats and Republicans are boring. <laughs> this we're entertaining, right? So. You know, they, they may even make up lies about us. They may call us uh, doped up loonies or something like that on the radio program that's happened. They may have it all. But the, the fact is they're going to give us coverage. People are going to take it serious. They are taking it serious. And we're going to, we're just going to keep uh, going for this until they let us in the, the debates. And like I said before, if they don't let us in the debates, we get even more media coverage from it. So there's just no way we're going to lose. And I don't think there's any way they're not going to let us in those debates because of that. They don't want the bad publicity. They don't want... Uh, me, you know, making fun of them, or Marco making fun of them, so I don't think they're going to do that again. Now we're going to open it up for questions from the audience. Uh, I don't have any signed written ones to review, so we're just going to kind of open it up. Uh, we're going to kind of spread it around. John's already had a couple questions. We'll kind of rotate that. So, uh, any uh, questions from the audience? If you want, there was an online question I saw that we didn't cover, I don't know. Go ahead and pose it. Sure. It was talking about uh, what, if anything, should the government do in regards to soil and water conservation, and the nitrate issue, things of that nature. And uh, if you want, I can go on that or you can go Go ahead. I don't want to steal your answer. <laughs> Um, I don't know, that was one you saw, right, that popped up on there, so, so I think we just missed it or something. But uh, I think we, we move away from subsidizing, giving welfare, welfare to big uh, companies from outside the state, uh, big monoculture subsidies, and uh, we move away from the uh, renewable fuel standard, we move away from the failed experiment with ethanol, where most of our monoculture goes to. And uh, really, we're right now encouraging people to treat family farmers like low-level employees when they used to run the show of their own land. And I don't think, I mean, go out there and talk to a family that's farming right now and see if they, they really think that the farm bill has had their best interests in mind. See if they think that uh, that, that uh, you know, continued monoculture is is the path that they see to a bright future. What, what is this monoculture you're talking about? That is when you have acres and acres of just corn, just soybeans. Um, when the government props up one crop and says, okay, farmers that farm, uh, you know, grasses or wheat or aronia berries or hemp, once we we both agree that that should come back as an option in Iowa. Uh, you don't say, okay, 
these farmers, they got to fend for themselves, but the ones that uh, grow this corn that ties us to the federal government via the ethanol mandate, uh, we're going we're gonna to help them. And I think helping would not be the right word to use because I think they'll tell you that they feel used and abused by the government trying to, you know, mess with their prices and, and just give them more loans. And uh, we've lost so many family farms and so many people have lost their land by continuing this trend. I think we need to hit the brakes and reverse uh, right away. And I also think that, uh, you know, people are going to say, what about the farmers? What, why can't we subsidize them if we're subsidizing everything else? I think that's possible. I think you tie subsidies to things like quotas for water and soil conservation. And you say, if you're not, uh, you're not meeting these, you don't get the state, the state help. And uh, I really think that... Uh, Tying that in to tax reform is another thing that could work. Um, encouraging farmers to actually grow perennials and things that are better for the water and soil. And uh, really, if you if you do something like comprehensive tax reform, and you say we're going to work to end the income tax in four years, or you know down the road set a goal, and we're going to lower property taxes, but in return. We're going to give so much of our sales tax to water and soil conservation, to mental health funding. I think that's how we how we get uh, address some current issues and uh, work towards a leaner, more efficient government while doing it. Yeah, part of the uh, proposals that I've came across that Ron Corbett, who's running I guess Kim Rose, the Republican primary, was to raise the sales tax. I forget why. I don't know. I mean, I figured up his number, whatever amount to. Uh, to solve this issue. The money already exists if you want to take it out of uh, the Department of Agriculture, the other Secretary of State's office. You can maneuver things around and you can pay for it that way. Uh, and you just put it in the general budget if you're going to spend money. We don't need a, a new tax. We don't need a separate tax. The money's already in the general fund. We can take from the general fund. Now, one thing that, uh, that we do is we talk a little bit about the subsidies here. Uh, so a lot of, not really subsidies so much in the, the ethanol right now, there's the mandates. Uh, I think that first of all, what we should do is, is they do have a point. We, the, the government, the federal government, does subsidize big oil. We should end all subsidies, all mandates, level the playing field, and we would be able to compete. So we should not have, you know, one market, I mean, oil companies, should not get subsidies, should not get uh, tax breaks or anything else that the farmers here do not. And then we just let the market decide on these things, but we have to take it away from everyone. We can't just take it away from Iowans. We don't just take it away from the oil companies. We take it away from everyone. We see what uh, what the market allows when it comes to this. And I, you know, I, as far as you know, tying subsidies that you're going to do this, I don't like the idea of you know the government tying. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll give you a tax break if you do what we want. That's the same thing the federal government does with uh, right now when when they want like uh, alcohol laws, for example. Like, uh, how you're going to enforce them? They hold the the strings, right? that if you don't do exactly and pass the laws that we want, we're going to cut your highway funding. So things like that, we've got to be very careful to allow the government to do. They'll end up promoting their favorite business, their uh, crony business partner, over the other businesses out there. And I think we've got to be very careful to watch that happen. Uh, in the absence of other questions uh, from the audience, uh, Marco is uh, Discuss an issue, Jake. Do you have any other issue that you'd like to discuss before we wrap up here? I have a question. Go ahead. Um, so historically, Iowa hasn't really had any emissions testing, right? Um, where I'm from, there's emissions testing. Would that ever be implemented into Iowa state law for the environment? Why don't you start on that? Uh, certainly possible. I'm not, not aware of. You know, in current laws, it's certainly possible that that would happen. It's uh, also certainly possible that uh, private, you know, private individuals, private organizations would come up with that as well. Uh, I know as far as any, any laws, I don't know of any, uh, I would certainly think it would be possible for it to happen. I think uh, from going around talking to people in business currently, working with the land and, and running 
these sorts of operations that, that might actually run afoul of some sort of limit in that regard. Um, I really think creating a system that's fair to uh, a guy living in rural Iowa, for a woman starting a farm in rural Iowa, whatever we have, and uh, I think making the system more balanced towards them versus some big agricultural corporation that has built wealth over hundreds of years of crony policies, uh, just moving. Uh, in my, my discussions, a <coughs> farmer that is less dependent on the government is a better steward of the land. I mean, they're going to want to have this property that they pass on to their children if they want, that they pass on to a family member. Uh, we used to have this history of the family farm. My, my dad grew up on one in Minnesota, <coughs> and uh, we really have less and less of that uh, with these types of uh, factory farming that we subsidize. So I think uh, you, you basically let the market take over. You free, give people more agricultural freedom, and you're not going to need to tell people not to pull you. Uh, that's going to be handled through civil court, I believe. You can't just use some kind of pesticide that's going to destroy your neighbor's crop. You can't just let your you know, swine nitrates go off into the stream. And, and now we have the technology to test where that's coming from. And a farmer, if, if they can't talk to their neighbor and work with them on those issues, uh, there's going to be a lot of lawsuits, and, and it's going to happen more. We're going to see it more and more. And I think the civil system is going to address that as opposed to putting sorts of uh, caps on what farmers can and can't do. Are there any more questions from the audience? Awesome. Uh, <clears throat> if you would, how would you transition from public education into a market? I think that it's, that it's happening, maybe slowly, more slowly than a lot of us would like. Uh, a big argument as to why we need these public schools uh, is to keep kids safe, is what they say, or to have this uniform education. And I really, myself, don't see those to, there's more fear-mongering to that than anything. I don't think there's any evidence to show that homeschool kids are more at risk to abuse. If, if anything, they're going to be more at risk to maybe failing the, the pop culture quiz. Uh, they might not know, you know who Taylor Swift is or something like that. They might not have a kid that has a locker next to them that's selling every drug that Reagan and Nixon told us we, that was bad for us. Because that's what I had growing up in school, in public school. And uh, you have these police officers coming to your class and telling you, you know, dare, just say no. And then you got kids that are selling drugs down the hall. So the idea that we're protecting kids um, through public school is pretty absurd to me. I mean. I saw more violent things there than I saw visiting my friends that homeschool. And um, I think because people see that every day, um, there's more interest in homeschooling now than there ever has been. I think it's something like 2% of eligible uh, kids that are school age homeschool right now. So why is the government so concerned in letting a few families have the freedom to do that sort of thing when the kids that they are educating are, are you know, going downhill in terms of testing and they're just throwing more and more money at it? So to me, the, the homeschooling is actually a really a bright uh, spot on the map that more people are interested in that. And I think, uh, I think that's the trend. I don't know that we really have to do anything uh, short of, I think we can encourage homeschooling and improve the people that want to use public schooling at the same time. I think it's a very bad thing to say we're pitting homeschoolers versus public education. If, if you want people to turn away from homeschooling, you think that's the problem, then, you know, look at what we're doing. Uh, we don't need to spend more money 
uh, to improve because we keep throwing money at the problem in terms of public education and things keep seem to be going in the wrong direction. Uh, one example is in New Hampshire, I'll bring that up again. They have no income tax and their education is world renowned. One of the best places you could go to a public school on the planet. So I think a leaner, uh, more uh, private world as opposed to more public uh, education is, uh, is going to be a really positive thing. Uh, one thing I can address really quick about, uh, about uh, education. So we've got to look at a few factors. Yeah, let's make it easier. Let's cut any unnecessary regulations on homeschoolers. Let's cut any unnecessary regulations on private schools. Let the market decide. Now, of course, we've got a few Iowa, largely rural, so we've got a few factors we can't ignore. You're probably not going to see a dozen uh, you know, schools show up in Decatur County, for example. That's probably not going to happen. It's not going to happen in Red Oak. That's okay. You can open this up. You can make sure that people are allowed to open and roll in whatever district they want to. Whatever schools work best, those are the ones that will thrive. The market will sort the problems out. So it's just, just like retail. I've worked in retail uh, many years, retail management. Retail works very well. They come up with new innovative ideas all the time. They're constantly finding way, better ways to get the product to the consumer. They're doing it because of competition. If somebody really is poor, look at what's happening to all these uh, retail stores that have done a very poor job. They're going out of business. And what's happening? Your prices have gone down. You've got more products than ever before. Everything is better because of it. Your, the economy grows because of it. Inflation goes down because of it. Same way with education. If you provide more options, ultimately what will happen, it's going to take a while, ultimately what will happen, the home school, private school, whatever, costs will go down dramatically, and test scores, whatever you're measuring it by, and the intelligence of the student, that's all going to go up. The safety of the students is all going to go up because people are not going to send their children to a school that's not safe, to a school that doesn't educate, to a school that doesn't prepare them for the future. And so we, we need to stop all this, uh, this nonsense of attacking homeschool parents, for example, attacking good people. That should, not, that should not happen. We need to make sure that everyone has the resources out of education in Iowa, and we'll do that through letting the market decide. Okay. Um, oh. uh, I, I know in Iowa, there's been small towns who have been hostile to uh, business. Since um, going to town, I know ten, a couple, like, ten years ago, uh, Walmart Bash Pro, Walmart wanted to put a warehouse in Joy Valley, Walmart wanted to put the store in Joy Valley before the city council closed, and there's a, uh, there has been a city council member on the Missouri Valley for basically scaling around late businesses. How do you encourage small towns to invite business and not scare them away? <laughs> you know, as governor, unfortunately, it's very little. You know, I, you've got to be honest occasionally and say, as governor, you know, a lot of candidates will get up and say they'll make promises of all the stuff they can do. You know, it's going to sunshine every day. I think that's what Kim Reynolds said, right? It's a bright new day. You know, as the Moody Blues said, the sunshine we've been waiting for will turn to rain, right? Governor cannot, unfortunately, force a small town to do something, even if it's in their own economic interest. What will eventually happen, though, is the towns that do bring in business will survive, they will thrive. Other people will eventually adopt those ideas. They will have to, they will do that, or unfortunately, they will, they will wither up and die. That's just the way it is. But as governor, I can't go in there and tell this town, this is what you're going to do. The governor is a dictator, doesn't have that sort of authority. Uh, but we can encourage, we can encourage um, businesses, for example, to come over from other states. And we do that by keeping a fair market. And I say fair market, that means we don't give something to your competitor that keeps you away, that we don't benefit one business over another. We don't say, we like this business, so you guys cannot come in. We, we don't do that as a state. There's plenty of things to do with, like, within the Iowa Department of uh, Economic uh, you know, you know, Bribery, as I like to call it. <laughs> no, okay, they call it development. I'm sorry. Um, no, and what they do is they, they basically bribe corporations to come in here. And it's, it's funny what they do with this. So they bribe a corporation and they say, well, we'll, we'll come in here and we're not going to pay taxes for 20 years. Small businesses are going to pay the taxes. We're not going to pay it. Puts them up enough for advantage, right? Then it comes time for the city, 20 years are up, and they say, you know what, we are going to leave if we don't get our tax break extended. You know what? 
But, you know, don't let the door hit you on the way out to Illinois. Where else are you going to go? Iowa's a great place for it. And if so, we will replace them with new small businesses forming up, other businesses coming in because they want this opportunity that we've got right here in the state. I've, I've heard a lot of people, a lot of people have brought me similar concerns. And I think what we can do is foster this environment of sound money and minimal taxation that will encourage people to start their own business. I've had multiple friends. I've started my own business. And it's, it's really hard to do right now. And I want to make it past a couple of years. And uh, I think that if you look at the cities and towns that are actually growing in population right now in Iowa, they're doing that by starting innovative businesses. They're not doing that by bringing in, oh, a new you know multinational company bringing in a fertilizer plant or bring in a new Walmart necessarily. I don't think uh, we should have any policies that force them not to do that or that work against that. But I think uh, going back to that idea of we already have this money we're spending to train Iowans to do jobs, um, let's spend them to uh, keep those jobs in some place like Fairfield that's growing their population. And they're going to ask very soon, um, a lot of people think they're doing things right in government. Uh, they're, they're doing positive things for business, but very soon they're going to run into actually needing employees. They're not going to have enough labor. And if we can actually use the money we're already using to train Iowans to fill jobs that they're going to you know, they're going to actually do in Iowa. I think that's a win-win situation and helps work against this kind of idea that we don't want, you know, new business ideas. We don't want uh, a different skill set for our workers and that sort of thing. We've got time for uh, one more question. Uh, any burning questions out there? This one got a question for a while, actually. John? Okay. Um, I wanted to touch on something that neither one of you touched on in your talk so far, and that is school vouchers. School vouchers are where the funds follow the student, not the school, and they benefit not only private schools, but homeschoolers that way. And I think that would be an elegant solution to give private schools and homeschoolers an equal footing where they can actually compete on a level playing field. And not only that, but fertilizers that are, you know, commercial chemical fertilizers are the biggest reason well, for nitrate. Let's focus on one question. Okay. And, and, and put it in the form of a question. Okay. What would you do if you were successful in your run for governor to switch us over to a school voucher system. I think right now the, the threat is more to, uh, I think Republicans in Iowa right now are warm to school vouchers. I think the legislation, if not there already, is going to be and, and perhaps get to, uh, if not to our desk, uh, near to our desk through the powers of government perhaps in the next four years. And um, I think you can do that by, by creating this environment that why, if we're going to subsidize education, why should we not give people that option? And I, I really, I personally don't have a problem with it. The legislator, legislature can get that to my desk. I'm, I'm going to be a fan of letting people have that decision. And when I talk about market competition, that's one thing that definitely I was, I was in favor of. Uh, another thing also that we could look at doing is tax credits as well. So if you're spending money to send your kid to a private school, if there's any incurred cost that you have, that you get money off your taxes the same way with homeschooling, make sure we continue that, make sure we don't take that away from anyone. That's, that's going to be some of the biggest things. Uh, vouchers as well, that's, that's another possibility. But any way to increase competition, uh, whether it be, like I said, allowing open enrollment in any district of your choice, you know, of course there's there's one that somebody's not going to fly their kid across the state to go to another school, but uh, within the area, the people will do, and the schools that uh, that do best will ultimately benefit and, and survive. And uh, the ones that do poor will either have to change or they will go out of business, and something will replace them. 
we've uh, about reached the end of the debate, and it's time for the candidates to summarize why they would be a good Iowa governor. So Jake, do you want to lead off? There, there's two things to consider. One is who we want to be the Libertarian nominee, who we want to represent the Libertarian Party. That's the first thing we have to consider. Why would I be, why would I be the best Libertarian nominee, in my opinion? Uh, Marco may disagree. Now, uh, I think that I've got the media coverage, I've got the name recognition, I've ran for office before, I know what to do, what not to do. Uh, I know how to get the media coverage, I've done that, I've proven that I can, I've got more media coverage I think, than anyone that's uh, ran for uh, Iowa governor in the past as Libertarian has ever got. That is, that is critical. It's also critical to know how to run an organization, how to run a business, these are skills, uh, how to market to the population, that way we can make sure we get or we maintain that major party status and that we get the necessary votes that we've got for that as long as, as well as attempting to, to win the election as best we can. So that's a key thing. This, the second part of it is, you know, why would I be a great governor? Because I know I was actually talking about, and Marco is too, I, I won't uh, throw him under the bus here, but libertarians are the only ones that are actually talking about the real issues. So when we look at uh, what problems the state is having, the Democrats, they'll talk about some of the issues, but they'll leave out the other parts. They're, they're leaving out, you know, actual cutting things in the budget. They just, I don't know where they think they're going to get the money from, right? They say, well, we've got budget problems, we've got price problems, but uh, well, we've got some, uh, some real problems there. Uh, and they continue to take our, uh, our civil liberties away, as we've seen. They don't, uh, they don't care about them. That's something that I would address. You know, restoring the, the voting rights to anyone that is about paid for their time, uh, or paid for their crime and serve their time. That's important. So there's so many things that we have to do, listening to all islands, not acting unhinged, and not calling other people unhinged, making sure we make friends in this and bringing more people into the party. Thank you, Jake. Marco, your summary of why you'd like to become a Iowa. Sure. I have worked. Uh, within the ranks of both major parties before they gave us an opportunity to participate. And I think I have positive relationships with some people in both parties, and I've seen them uh, shut out the candidates that I supported, change rules to keep uh, the candidates that I supported uh, going, out, going into positions of power within the party. Uh, so I think I can rely on that to have a positive relation with both sides and kind of get us beyond this left versus right and uh, looking at it more as liberty versus tyranny. And uh, I really think my platform speaks to what a lot of Iowans are needing right now and some are suffering, uh, medical freedom, agricultural freedom, and economic freedom. And uh, I go into that in depth on my website and I also and writing a book about how we get these ideas addressed in the next four years, the next eight years, and so on. And uh, I really think my platform is appealing to rural Iowans as well as city Iowans. I was raised in Des Moines, but I have family in rural Iowa. I have friends in rural Iowa. I live on an acreage right outside the zoo, so I walk a couple blocks one way, and it gets pretty rural pretty quick. So I think. Uh, I see a lot of overlap between what these uh, people are telling me that's, that's going on, be it in the city or the rural islands. And, um, you know, I think that uh, my platform is also going to appeal to the wealthier islands as well as to islands that are living paycheck to paycheck or worse. It's not, uh, it's moving beyond these battles of left versus right, of rich versus poor, of you know, race versus race, whatever. It's giving every citizen uh, the same liberty and the same freedom. Our, our platform doesn't work at all if we don't uh, apply that across the board. And that's what uh, our platform strives to do. Thank you, uh, Jake and Marco, for uh, participating in this historic debate and dedicating yourself to running for governor. Uh, thank you to the entire audience for coming out here to support the Libertarian cause and witness Iowa history in the making. I invite you to stick around and uh, meet and greet with Jake and uh, Marco and congratulate them on their excellent performance. And uh, 
Let's give a uh, Marco and Jake a standing ovation. <laughs> Thanks right here to this guy who has moderated this, the first uh, Libertarian Party of Iowa gubernatorial primary debate. We thank you very much for, for doing that. It's a great honor to have you here for being able to expose this. So thank you on behalf of Thank you, Thank you. Shake again there. Let me get a picture of it. Right there. Hey, hold on. Now. Yeah, it was real for a second. Oh, yeah. Oh, that flag has fringes on it. It has fringes on it. No. Oh, it's so different. Why would they put that in here?